show your shirt, Rob, what we're looking I'm for. I'm saving it for 835. Oh, okay. I'm well, saving it for 835. About it. Yeah, you, it's going to be there front and center. By the way, at 835, we'll have uh, Joe Ferretti by phone. Mike Carl will be in studio. And uh, Delegate Pat McGeehan will be sitting in on the Friday Five while Delegate Mike Height rides the rails out to the Grand Canyon. Ooh. Or on the way back, I guess. Now. Is he returning yeah, now? I believe so. Yeah. So, anyway, I understand that he questioned your memory of the Grand Canyon. He did, yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, he may be right. But and it, I always hate to admit that. Was it a bridge or something? It is a bridge, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, my wife and I spent uh, a marvelous trip several years ago going down the Grand Canyon on doors, not the rafts, but small four person doors. It took us 21, 22 days to go through. And uh, Mike was talking about hiking down the bottom of it, which you can with the uh, trail. Uh, but he said going across the Grand Canyon. I did not remember a bridge at Phantom Ranch. Uh, but the first thing he did was send me a picture of the bridge at Phantom Ranch. So he was evidently right. Now the question is, was it there when I went under that bridge? Did I ever go under that bridge? I don't know. So what that means, like, was it built after the 1830s? That, thanks, Larry. I knew that was coming, but I was expecting that from, Larry, uh, from Rob, not from you. I tagged out on that one, yeah. Our guests in this segment, escorted, by the way, by former delegate Sarah Blair, who's the ghost over my shoulder in the, in the corner back there, Sarah. And uh, they are Diana Phillips, the provost of Fairmont State. Diana, good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you for inviting us here this morning. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. I'd be surprised how many people I invite that don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and also Brent Levin, he's the uh, president of KVC. Good morning, Brent. How are you? Good morning. So you have to settle this bet that we all have as to what KVC actually stands mm-hmm. for. because yep. we have, and, and come a little closer to your mic too, Brent, if you don't mind. I knew you would ask that. <laughs> so our business started in Kansas. And there's a river called the Caw River, and it started out as a group home, three children in the group home, and it was called Caw Valley Center. And that's where KVC came from. How do you spell Caw? K-A-W. Just like it sounds. Just like it sounds. That's right. Well, that's not what we were thinking. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, what we were thinking was close, which was Kanawha. We had yeah. Kanawha, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's an interesting story. When we when we came to West Virginia, we started out in Charleston, and there there was a Kanawha Valley Center, mm-hmm. a KVC Kanawha Valley Center. But that's not you. That That's not us. You're Ka. We, are, we were in KVC, Kansas yeah, 25 KVC. years ago, but now yeah. we're just KVC. Only well, Kansas would have a... A place <laughs> named after the sound a crow makes. All <laughs> right? I it's guess, because yeah, it's a call. Well, yeah. And so that's great. That's a great name. So what Good you, story, too. It was a neat story, yeah. And so what you folks are doing at Fairmont, and combining with KVC on this, and I think the West Virginia legislature is involved in this a little bit, too, is, is you're helping the foster care system in West Virginia. Can you explain how you got involved in this, Diana? Yes. Um, so Brent and I met in the summer of 22 and because we had hosted on our campus something called a First Star Program. Mm-hmm. We can talk more about that later, we, but it's also something that KVC is involved in. And Fairmont State University is the only university in the state of West Virginia to host that camp. And that summer we were hosting a summer camp for children from the foster care system. Mm-hmm. Brent and I met that summer and we started talking about this idea in my past life in different states i've created something called an early college high school as an educator and basically an early college high school is where you graduate from high school with an associate's degree or 60 credit hours towards a bachelor's degree they've they've existed in the united states for decades everybody should adopt that everybody and in fact in maryland we were at a place when i uh, left maryland where I was working with the superintendent of schools to create that for the entire county in mm-hmm. Harford County. But yes, it is something that our legislatures here is supportive of uh, dual enrollment programs. So Brent and I were talking about the needs of the foster youth and this idea started percolating and it kept percolating from there. And how did you become involved in this? Brent? Well, like she said, we, we do a, a, a partnership with a, with a program called First Star and they are in several major universities around the country, and, and we bring um, youth to college campus in the summertime. And and we had been kind of working this idea for quite some time with um, wouldn't it be nice, 
rather than just bringing kids to campus for one week or for two weeks, what if we hosted a whole program on campus? And so that's where it started. It's Diana Phillips, let's start a school. That's basically how it was, start a school for youth and care. And how many kids can be in this program? Um, this summer, we're, we will start our first cohort this year. It will be 50 11th graders, and they will move up next year, and we'll enroll another 50 11th graders. So once fully subscribed, it'll be 100 students in the program. And these are all foster care children? All foster care children. How do you select them? They, um, it is an application process, so students need to be interested in it. They need to be recommended by an adult somewhere from some place and then they will go through an intake process uh an applic an application mm -hmm. process they will meet with folks from fairmont state and kbc and um go from there bill yeah a phenomenal program uh, uh how how who covers expense are the kids are the kids responsible for the tuition or everything's covered and where does it come from the children are not responsible okay. for the expense. It is covered, and part of it is a philanthropic partnership, uh, which KVC will talk about. And from our side of the house, it is the legislators. Um, President Blair has been a champion of the program. The West Virginia State mm -hmm. Legislature is funding uh, the the startup of the program. So the kids for, will, for Fairmont State the side. The kids of the house. will stay at Fra Fairmont State. And they will. Yeah. They will live on campus. Yeah. Year round, mm -hmm. and the other question that Rob kind of alluded to it: the how do you find with interest these kids? A lot of them have had a very rocky road ahead of them, and there is a tendency of those folks in that that position to be a little skeptical of, uh, of the future, or the skeptical of higher education. What's how do you find their how how do they get interest? How do they why are they, how they're motivated to come to your program? I'm not questioning after they get in the program, but coming to the program. And I'll let I can answer that. Yeah, go yeah. for it, Brent. So, so like I mentioned before, our experience with, with our First Star Academy, we see a lot of very, very high-performing youth. They just happen to be in foster care. Um, we also see a whole lot of trauma, and we see a whole lot of clinical, what we call clinical need. And so these kids get a lot of, of therapeutic intervention. And what we found with First Star it's when you pull out some of that clinical and what we call pathologizing the problem, when you pull that out and you begin to just work with these kids as kids, and then they begin to work with each other. And that's where you see the magic. So they are very accustomed to um, partnering with people pretty quick. And so you see this, the magic really is in the group of kids that you bring to campus. So they're ready when they get there as far as being um, student ready. But then we have to look at a lot of other things that might, go, that might be needs. And trauma is the big one. So we do a lot of training around trauma and just helping people understand, you know, what, what these, young, these young adults have been through. Yeah, so, uh, that age, there's a lot of vari variation anyway, but I would think coming from a lot of several different type of background, do you find difficulty of, of, of striking a balance? Of, uh, you have some probably very poorly performing children and some much higher performing. So I would think that the problem that all school systems encounter, you'd find it even more so. Well, this is a program that's not for every youth yeah. that's in foster care. You know, I mean, this is a bit of a niche. And, you know, we're talking about 50 kids yeah. to, to start out with. And, uh, you know, currently there's a little over 6,000 kids in that's care. That's my question. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah so, so this, is, this is not for everybody. Um, it's for a very select few, really. And one last question before Larry takes over. Uh, how do you identify these kids? You say you go through application. Uh, do you have a lot of application of these 50 slots? So we just we just announced the program. Yeah. Uh, there was a press conference a couple of weeks ago. Now yeah. mm -hmm. we are we are advertising statewide because mm -hmm. uh, children children from the foster care system from, can come from all fifty five counties. Yeah. We've got a um, internet marketing campaign going. Brett and I are out talking about mm -hmm. the program. We've got we're going door to door in many respects. 
uh, in high schools across the mm -hmm. state, just talking to anybody that we can talk to sure. about the program. And, and there is an important distinction here that this is a voluntary program. Correct. Now this, this is a program that youth have to want to be a part of. Now it's our job to present that so yeah. they so they understand, and and so there also is a third partner here that we we actually need to need to mention. It's the Department of Education. Absolutely. And um, a, a a young man named Jacob Green is is the leader of of that operation that we work with, and he has been very pivotal in developing a program that is called an Option Pathway. And so it really is the, it's how we tie the high school piece into the college piece where the youth can get their high school diploma. Okay, this isn't a GED. At the end of this, they will have a high school diploma and they will have opportunity to have earned a, an associate's degree or credits towards their bachelor's degree. Larry Schultz. Yes, one of the most fascinating things to, to me about this is this notion that a lot of foster care kids in their usual life are not surrounded by degreed, um, certified, uh, educated uh, adults. And now they're going to be surrounded by them. They'll literally be at a college where everybody who's above a certain age already has a degree. And it's going to be fascinating to watch how that culture uh, and that submersion in that culture has an effect on some of the kids that you might wonder whether they've got the, um, well, they've got the native intelligence to do it. They'll suddenly through effort because they like what they are experiencing, want to stay in the group. It's just a wonderful idea. Um, I myself, uh, am a first generation college student. I joined the United States Navy out of high school because I didn't have an opportunity at that point in time to go to college. My son, of course, is a college graduate and he works for the public defender's office in, uh, upstate New York. The environment makes a great deal of difference. It's called cultural capital, as I'm sure, you know, and absolutely these by the fact that they'll be living on campus uh, 12 months, 12 months out of the year, um, they will be immersed in, in an environment where education matters, where higher education really matters. And where what is even more important about that, I think, is this is a real opportunity for a future that they perhaps did not envision before this. And they would have perhaps been wise not to get their hopes up to envision such a thing given that they're you know coming from the foster care program and and everybody uh, is doing the best they can but you know the advantages of a child who's not in the foster care program are fairly obvious Correct. Uh, and so uh, it's just wonderful to reach to that point and say we're going to make this opportunity available and and that is exactly it too it is an opportunity the the ch the foster youth has to come to the table they have to want to be there they um we 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 call it you know there's a certain level of maturity but you also need to understand that and Larry uh Brent can talk about this in detail these are children that have a great deal of resilience when you're in the foster care system and you get pulled from pillar to post, let's just use that language, you do have to adopt quickly and adapt, not only adopt, but adapt. So we, we, as Brent says, this isn't for everybody, but for those youth that understand and want to apply themselves and see this as a, as a future for themselves, they will be able to what I call sparkle and shine. Diana Phillips and Brent Lemon are our guests here on the program. We're talking about the Middle College Foster Care Program that is going to be uh, taking place at uh, Fairmont State University. Give me the nuts and bolts of how this is going to work. Are these, are these 50 kids who will be effectively juniors in high school housed in their own separate dormitory? Uh, do they have a, a, a dorm uh, mom or dad, so to speak? Uh, is it co-ed? Are they separate wings? Who gets them to their meals and where they need to be? Because these are minors here. Absolutely, and, and you hit on many of the many of the components of the program. Yes, we do have a dedicated residence hall. Yes, there will be adults in the facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, I, I can't say we'll be 
escorting them to the dining hall because it's in the building right next door, they will be college students. The, the place where it will be different for them is in the residence hall. They, they will, it, will be just a de- it will be a dedicated residence hall for, child, for folks in the middle college, kids in the middle college. Other than that, they'll be in classes with students across campus. They'll be able to um, be part of clubs and activities. It's an immersion program. It's not, we're, they're not, they won't be other. They will be part of the community, the Fairmont State community. So they're taking English 101 and philosophy 101 and everything else a freshman in college would take. Correct, correct. Well, what about the the, uh, junior and senior year in high school? Taking courses equivalent to junior and senior year in high school as well? So that's why it's called a dual enrollment, yes. dual credit program. They will take one class and get credit for both. That's why we've got the West Virginia Department of Education deeply Im- involved as the third, the third stool, the third leg of this partnership. Um, so their English 101 class will also meet the requirements for high school. Uh, yes, but most of their fellow students have already graduated from, from high school. So that means they've had certain background information that these kids will not have had, such as uh, uh, junior mathematics or a senior, a senior uh, history, whatever the case may be. How do you, you don't dumb down, I hate to use that word. You not don't at all. It. But uh, so you expect these kids to kind of make that jump to be on the same level as kids two years older that had two, two additional years of training. I, that, is, that is the case, which is why it's not for everybody. But you also have to remember, we already have dual enrollment programs. We already have kids in high school right now taking college classes all across the state, all across the country. So, um, and we could, we could have a whole show about, you know, the efficacy of our current system of education in this country, but age isn't the, um, age isn't the qualifier that maybe we thought it was when, when we were, when we were, uh, you know, in, in high school, it's a little bit different in today's world. So students are successful in programs uh, in early college programs, and students are successful in dual enrollment programs all the time. Now, KVC is going to be new to West Virginia, but it was in, around Kansas for a while. Oh, and we've I, been in West Virginia for oh, quite have some you time. for a while? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the success rate? Have you do you have some some history of how well the students do? Well, this is a first of its kind program uh, within throughout the nation. Throughout, the, Throughout nation. the nation, I misunderstood that. I thought I thought the fact the name came from Kansas that you had already had an established program in Kansas. No, this school program, this partnership with a college, a university, and a foster care child placing agency to have students live on campus twenty four seven. That is the new concept okay. that has not been done before. That we are breaking ground. That's breaking right. And, and I and I did want to mention and. In the foster care world, safety, permanency, and well-being are like paramount for us and for the youth to provide that. And so the living environment, the whole environment of the campus, we will have safety, permanency, and well-being. How that's defined, not defined as walking them to class, but there will be safety built in, permanency, so so a youth feels like this is home and the well-being of having all the services that they would require out there on campus or in the community. Does this effectively sever the tie between the foster parent and the student in school, or does that relationship continue while they're in this program? No, no, no. We, and this has nothing to do with placement at all. So, so we, we, we encourage the youth to stay in contact with their foster family, and we encourage the family. We'll be having family on campus. We'll also be building foster care community within the Fairmont area, local as well, with volunteers and folks coming to campus to to work with these youth there as well. What is the price tag on this program? Well, I mean, we're looking at upwards of $60,000 per youth per year for Mm -hmm. this program. Again, it's fully funded through um, donation and through the legislature. So it's it's not coming out of the foster care because you'll hear 
foster care system is struggling. They, this isn't coming out of their budget. Mm -hmm. so. This is out of the general budget of the state or the, the education? To, uh, general the budget of the state, thanks to um, President Blair of the Senate, thanks to the governor, and thanks to Speaker Hanshaw. They are supporting the startup of mm -hmm. the program. Frankly, because it is the first of its kind in the United States, we will launch this summer and we will also start a national philanthropic uh, campaign. So if you have 50 as juniors, they become seniors. If all 50, let's just say 100% come back and, and do it, do you then bring in another new 50 for the next year? Correct. So, so there's always 100 in the program at a minimum? Correct. At, by year two. So this summer we'll start with the 11th graders because it takes two years. They will be earning 60 credit hours. So they will be getting a high school diploma, as Brent says, and an associate's of arts degree at the end of the two years. So first year, they're 11th graders. They move up. Then we enroll a new cohort of 50 students. So fully subscribed, we'll have 100 students in the program. And, and I do we've, need to mention, I'm, I'm sorry. But I was just going to say, we've been reading a lot about the difficulties uh, of higher education in West Virginia. Declining enrollments and declining budgets and faculty uh, uh, either being laid off or walking away. And this looks like it's a win-win in the sense that, okay, uh, we're going to address the fact that uh, we don't have enough young people to fill all these slots by going out and getting the kids who need it the most. When did that first occur to you? Was that before or after you came up with this idea? It had no bearing on my youth going to school as, as it, from the foster care system, providing them an opportunity that uh, maybe other kids might have the encouragement to know that they can do this, providing that for these kids that are in care. And I got to be honest with you, uh, Fairmont State is is uh, an institution that is fiscally stable and very sound. So it really wasn't part of the equation. When we first met, and because of my background creating early college high schools, understanding, meeting the kids in the First Star program, it was just a natural I'm, I'm a, I, I was born and raised, I was born in Huntington, West Virginia. I was raised by my grandmother. I went to a two room schoolhouse when I was in first grade. I am a first generation college student. These kids in the first star program, it was just a natural fit. So, I mean, it, you know, um, this is, this is about, I'm an educator to the tip of my toes. This is about us providing an opportunity for, for our most deserving, a most deserving population to get ahead. Um, it is fortunate that, you know, President Blair and Governor Justice and Speaker Henshaw saw what a wonderful opportunity, a real solution. It's been described to me as this is a real solution for a very difficult problem that we have in our state. And as we all know in this room, Education is generational. Higher education is generational. When we change the lives of these students, that will change the lives of their children as well. So that's why it's a real solution. And I think that's why the legislature was so supportive. And I, and I just can't say enough about uh, one of the reasons we're up here in, in, in Martinsburg is President Blair was a champion for the program from the get-go. He, he, we uh, met with him my first day meeting with the governor. I also met with um, President Blair and both of them immediately got behind the program. We are just about out of time. And uh, for those listening to the program uh, or watching along on our Facebook stream and now TV 10, which I see has <laughs> just been uh, reinstated too. They're nicely done over there, Mike and uh, Colin. How can they get more information on this program and eventually apply? So go to our website, fairmontstate.edu. They're a forward slash middle MC for middle college and information is on the website. And that's the first place to go. Uh, by the way, for those of you, if, if you're a TV 10 viewer, uh, this interview was recorded and will be reposted on YouTube, our WRNR TV YouTube channel. You can watch the entire interview as a replay once it gets posted on there before uh, noon today. So if you missed it on TV 10 because of the technical difficulties, you will be able to watch the entire interview uh, in its uh, rerun form. Thank you so much for being here. Any closing thoughts, uh, Diana or Brent? We look forward to coming back in a year. 
and telling you how the first year went. I look forward Success. to that as well. Yeah, we look forward to that very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Well done. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah, thank you. Hey, this segment of the program today brought to you in part by WVU Medicine, Berkeley Medical Center, Jefferson Medical Center, leading